So I got a fun one for you guys this week. I had a customer reach out about the new Alpharex headlights for the Dodge Charger and uh, gave us the opportunity to go ahead and build a set. And I figured we could go ahead and do that on camera and you guys can kind of see what's inside, uh, what's different from the, the VLANs and the stock lights that most of us are familiar with and see how these are on the inside. Now, as you can see, I've already built the first side uh, for the passenger side here. And we do have the driver's side in the box. We're gonna open up the box, open up the lights, get inside of them. And I'm gonna show you how I would build a set of the Alpha Rex charger lights. I did want to cover uh, on these lights is the packaging of the lights themselves. Now, if you're familiar with shipping lights in the many different boxes that lights can come in, some are really bad, some are really good. Uh, I would actually put this one in a really good tier. Now, Alpharex has never really been bad at uh, boxing for lights, so that doesn't come as much of a surprise. But for those of you that might be interested, uh, this is really good packaging uh, for the lights themselves. So shouldn't be a whole lot of fear that they may be damaged in shipping uh, after you build them or coming to you. So uh, just a little info that you might find helpful. Now, as we typically see with charger lights, these do have a bracket that is removed from the bottom side here, which is two Phillips head screws, and then it'll slide right off the front and they are sealed with a perma seal. Now, if you're familiar with the uh, VLANs, which uh, up till now has been my primary uh, set of lights that I build, I'll buy VLANs and I'll build them out. Um, this perma seal is a lot better. So uh, a lot of people prefer to just cut the lights open because VLAN perma seal is quite a pain in the butt to open up. I would recommend just opening these in an oven. Um, the end result is just gonna be better than if you have to cut them. Obviously cutting is faster and you can seal them up, but as most of us know, the chances of having issues after when you seal them back up and you put them on the car is higher if you have to cut them open. Now, it's not always gonna be the case and you may be perfectly fine depending on how many times you've done them and how familiar you are with sealing them. I'm sure you can, you know, many of you probably don't have any concerns at all, but in my case, I just feel better if I know that I can open them and so uh, in this case, I'm gonna be opening them in the oven. Now, once again, uh, if you've seen the channel before, you know I have a convection oven. It's a little bit more of an industrial grade oven. Uh, these cost about two grand, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but the cool thing is it's convection. It does not have heat coils. It actually just moves the air around, so it does work better. So please keep that in mind. It may not be quite as easy as it is for me using this oven if you're using a standard kitchen oven, which is what most retrofitters use. Got it up, heated up right now. We're uh, running about 210 degrees Fahrenheit, 215. Actually probably gonna turn that up just a little bit. I'm gonna turn that up to about uh, two, 250. I like 250 for uh, perma seal and butyl. I like about 210 to 215. Uh, butyl is just really, really easy to open. Uh, it softens really easy. Perma seal, usually you need a little bit more heat. And beneficially from these, they are built really well. The quality of the plastics and everything uh, at 250, you're really not going to melt anything for you know less than 10 minutes, so like seven minutes at a time or so. So like 250 seemed to be a pretty good spot. So I am gonna go ahead and remove this bottom bracket. And once you remove the two screws, it just slides right off the front just like that. And other than that, they do not use any kind of staples. Uh, like if you're familiar with the VLANs, they usually will staple in across the uh, side of the light. Uh, in the case of this one, I do not see that. There is one other thing that you're going to want to remove, uh, and I learned this the hard way when I opened up the first one, but on these, they do actually have a module here, and if you do not remove this first and disconnect all the wires, it's going to make it really hard to get that front cover off because they are very tight in there uh, the way the wires are. So you're going to want to go ahead and just remove the four screws that hold this in place. 
And then just go ahead and disconnect the three plugs that are on the bottom of that, set it to the side. And once again, that's just gonna make it a lot easier once you pull the front cover off, because these wires are somewhat tight. And if it's still connected to this module, it's gonna make it a little bit more difficult. So now that we got that part off, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in the oven. Uh, once again, do make sure that you preheat your oven uh, just to reduce the chances of it spiking a little bit, possibly melting some plastic. We are talking about 250 to 260 degrees Fahrenheit here. So um, definitely make sure it's preheated where you want it to be uh, temperature wise and uh, go ahead and pop it in for about seven minutes. Uh, I like to go in increments of about seven minutes. So when you pull it out of the oven, uh, definitely make sure that you're wearing gloves or you consider that it is going to be rather hot, uh, even <laughs> as used to the heat as my hands are, I'm still gonna hold it with a glove because it is pretty warm. Now, uh, you're gonna be looking for a, a decent point that you can pry in and try to pry it out. Obviously, you're trying to not damage any of the plastic on the outside of the light, uh, but try to slowly pull back So I was able to get it mostly started around the side here. Uh, now it's already cooled down enough already. I'm gonna have to put it back in, heat it up again. But by then I should have a, a little bit more room to pry on it and get it out. Keep in mind, you know, depending on the kind of light you're working with, some of these are built differently than others. Some of them are a little bit cheaper plastics than others, so you can't be as rough with them. So, you know, just keep in mind if this is kind of your first set, opening up a set of lights, uh, just take your time, pry around the sides, try and loosen up that glue that's holding it together and if you need to put it back in the oven give it some more time so now i've got the lens separated from the back and inside of this light you're still going to have a lot of the glue running up in the channels and you're going to want to pull all that out uh, i'm going to do it over on the bench sitting down uh it does take a little bit of time but the idea is that heat will help here so if it's still warm it's going to come out a little bit easier if you do get to a point where it starts to get a little bit hard to pull it out you can throw this stuff back in the oven just you know separately and it will heat it up enough so it will kind of help a little bit but be really careful you might turn down the heat just a little bit uh, because when they are separated uh, it is more likely to warp a little bit possibly. So, you know, more like a 210, 215, and that'll help. You can use like a heat gun to warm up the permaseal around the outside and just kind of peel it out as you go. Uh, another method that you can use is to use a, an X-Acto knife like this, and you can just kind of like trim the stuff off with this. You don't have to get it perfectly clean. The idea is that you want to get as much of it off as you can so that you can put butyl in its place and seal everything back up. So I'm going to go ahead and start cleaning these lights out and then we'll come back to the next step. So as for the bezel itself, it is secured in place with six screws. I've already removed all six of those screws so I can just easily remove the bezel from the inside of the lens. And you want to set this aside, uh, being careful not to touch anything on the inside of the lens. Uh, place it uh, inside down, uh, outside up. That way any dust that settles, it's not going to settle on the inside, it'll settle on the outside instead. Um, I've already gone through this one and cleaned off all of the permaseal that was on the light. So when cleaning off the permaseal uh, using a X-Acto knife like this works pretty well. And you can just kind of cut it off basically, uh, and then just uh, peel it and throw it away. It works really well for this permaseal. Uh, it's not so much for things like the V-Lane permaseal. Uh, it's a little bit different process. So you just have to consider uh, the kind of permaseal that they're using and how well you can actually cut it off uh, and remove it. So in the case of this one, the razor blade works pretty well. So go ahead and set this to the side. And now we'll go ahead and move on to the bezel itself. And as you can see, uh, that is the front of the bezel there. And these are the LED diffusion uh, bars. Now, in some of my videos, you'll see where sometimes it's worth frosting and sometimes not for LED diffusion. Out of the way this one is designed, there's actually a 
fair amount of diffusion that these bars are doing. And frosting will help to diffuse the LEDs better, but it will also reduce the output of the LEDs. So there's a fine line between there. You don't always want to frost, uh, but sometimes you definitely should, should frost. Sometimes you should do it on one side, but not both. Sometimes you should do it on both sides. So it depends a lot. If you're doing a set of WRX uh, with the C lights, you're probably gonna wanna frost both sides. In the case of this set, I'm not gonna frost it at all because it actually diffuses the LEDs really well. On the back side, there's actually about an inch offset from the acrylic diffuser and the placement of the LEDs and where we're gonna put them. So it's actually really good spacing. Uh, the light output is excellent and there's not a huge benefit to the idea of frosting. Now, it is up to you as to what you wanna do. Frosting does kind of add a little white to the light if you wanna have a little bit of white in the lights. At the cost of output a little bit, uh, that is an option and these are pretty easy to remove with several screws around the light to actually remove the diffusers and uh, frost them in the cabinet. But, uh, I am gonna go ahead and remove the factory LED boards. As you can see, they just come wrap around here. And there are three screws holding this little bracket in place. And we'll go ahead and pull that as well and toss it. And then I am going to use a flathead screwdriver to pop each of these little PCB panels out. Um, in the case of these, the LEDs themselves, we're not gonna reuse them. So I don't have to be super delicate with it because uh, it's just gonna get tossed. Uh, but, you know, keep that in mind. If for some reason your plan was to reuse them or save them, uh, you're gonna wanna be a little bit more careful in this process versus just ripping them out like that. Uh, just to be super careful that you don't mess anything up. But once again, in my case, we're gonna toss them. Now, once you've removed those, you will see these little plastic tabs around the outside that held the PCB in place. Now, we're gonna wanna try to remove those so the new LEDs that we put in uh, can sit a little bit more flush. And I'm just gonna use these uh, little like uh, Oedeker style clippers here and just go right around the side here and just clip them right off like that. So traditionally on chargers, uh, you would go with a LED panel just like this, a uh, pre-cut strip that is to the shape and size of the charger lights. Now, in the case of this one here, it is a different design. So these standard panels, while they do fit, and if you're looking for a really easy install, you could certainly use these in place and just secure them in place with uh, some kind of glue or something. Uh, just to make sure they stay where they're supposed to be. And they will light it up. Uh, but uh, in the case of this to maximize output, uh, as you can see in the front here, they have almost like two diffusers with a splitter in between. It's like a black section. And it does actually output better and brighter if you use two rows of strips. And while you could possibly get away with using two of these and try to make it work, it's gonna be pretty tight. Ideally, I would go with our straight strips here and they are cuttable every three LEDs on the back side, and you can solder them to the shape of the panel. And so in the case of this one, uh, that is the method that I'm gonna go about it. And it ends up working pretty well because you can basically have two rows side by side that are the perfect size for the diffuser opening and it does output quite a bit of light beneficially as well if there was a section that went out it's almost like a double redundancy because you have two rows uh, and you can link those two rows together you just basically use a splitter and have those two rows on one channel and have them flow and that would end up getting you 
uh, the result of a redundancy, basically that if one LED side were to go out, the other side should pick up, uh, which will help with you know uh, a, a much more solid build uh, for a long term if something were to go wrong. But um, so that is going to be what I do now. Uh, the basic idea will be that I will take these strips, I will get the basic idea: how many LEDs do I want for each section? In the case of this one, probably cut about here, and then I'll measure up here and cut, and then cut, and then just start to create that shape. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, and then uh, once I kinda get the shape that I want, I'll come back and give you guys an idea of how uh, it all came together. I do now use this uh, consolidated wire, and I will try to put a link in this uh, video description uh, as to uh, where I get this uh, on Amazon. And I use that to create the links uh, between. And the reason being, this is a lot more flexible than the solid five mil pins that I used to use. Um, so it seems to have a less likeliness of detaching the pads on the back of these strips because uh, these are very rigid strips. So. I was finding that on occasion, uh, if a light were to flex too much, the hard pins from the five mil LEDs would actually detach that solder pad from the PCB, creating a broken connection inside the light. And since I switched to this, I really haven't seen that anymore. So I do like to use this. It is still somewhat solid. It's not like a, a, a bare wire. It does transfer the power very well. It's only 24 gauge, but it does a really good job. And uh, it's fairly easy to work with and super cheap. Uh, if you factor in just how long a roll like this will last making shapes out of the rigid PCBs, it works really well. So I'll go ahead and get that going. So I went ahead and got the boards uh, soldered up together, everything connected here. As you can see, I do have both of the connections here and I will join those together. But for now, for testing, I'm just gonna leave the JSTs on, test, make sure it's working right. And then I'll go back and actually just uh, splice these two together so it's one connection. And as you can see here, I was able to run two full rows with minimal trimming. I did trim a little bit right up here and a little bit right up here just uh, so that it fit pretty well on there. And I did have to do some bends and turns and things to make it fit. So uh, I'm sure you've seen my other videos I have on the channel where I go into more detail on the actual process of doing that, um, but it's not very difficult. And in the case of this, it works really well. So I was able to get two full rows and I also did some redundancy in there. Like I've got some little connection points like across here, uh, just so that if there was a connection that were lost, uh, it will pick back up and then start going down the line. And, uh, you know, so in the off chance that something were to somehow rattle loose or get disconnected, 
that is just one more little redundancy in there to try to keep everything running. I will say since I switched to using the consolidated wire like this, I haven't really had that issue, uh, but some of my older builds I did when I was just using the solid metal pins. So just keep that in mind. Um, definitely having a better luck with that as a whole. Uh, obviously in this kind of stuff, zero failure rate is ideal, but it's not always practical. Uh, so you get as close as you can to it. And by and large, it's pretty low uh, with a lot of the things that I've done and a lot of the parts that I've had developed, things like the UCS strips, which are, have pretty much eliminated a lot of the issues with uh, some of the cheaper SK issues. Uh, but even on some of the, the nicer SK stuff, some of the stuff that we sell, it's still not as reliable as UCS. UCS is just rock solid. It just, it just works, it takes a beating and it just keeps going. Um, as far as this one goes, uh, I was able to plug it up and do a test here and give you an idea on the actual output and what to expect. Uh, so we give all four or all two rows running and it loops up here. I did use a little bit of wire to kind of make that connection because this is somewhat of a sharp turn. So uh, while you probably could do it the same method as the rest of the connections, uh, the wire just gave me a little bit more flexibility with the whole thing so I could test fit, pull it out, make it the solder point connections and everything and it wasn't as big of a deal as if I tried to make this whole thing one big PCB it would be pretty difficult. I did secure it in place with the Gorilla Glue contact adhesive uh, and it has dried for several hours now, uh, so it is good to go. As you can see on the front side, output is quite nice on the UCS. Um, so uh, in my opinion, as of what is available on the market right now, this is definitely the best way to go uh, for an addressable color flow setup. Uh, output is pretty good. And if you consider this uh, comparatively to the standard boards that we sell for the standard charger lights, uh, you do have twice as many LEDs uh, than you do on those boards. So it will draw more power. That is one thing to keep in mind. If you're talking long-term at a car show, uh, you may end up needing to have uh, a larger battery or a backup battery, maybe a secondary battery in the trunk. Uh, lithium is something I do recommend for a lot of people for show cars because it does generally run a lot longer at a show. Um, I run lithium on my show cars. Uh, I used to try to mess with the AGMs, the deep cycles and things like that. And just long term, they just did not hold up and they almost always died by the end of the show. Once I switched to lithium batteries, they hold up really well and you can get a lithium battery for relatively cheap if it's not a high amperage battery so you got to consider it won't be able to start your car but it can run all your lighting so you kind of have to put that on a different circuit or uh, isolate that battery in some way so that it's not trying to start your car but it could maybe flip a switch or something and run all your lighting when you get to the show um, so you know whatever case you have to do for that uh, but uh as stated, everything is ready to go on this side, so I am going to go ahead and splice these wires together, cut rid of these pigtails. These are just power injection pigtails. Uh, I will not need the output, so I'm gonna get rid of that as well, and just create one JST connection that will connect to the back side of the light. And then when we come back, I will have the back side of the light up here, and we'll start going over that, uh, removing the projectors, and adding in uh, demon eyes, or at least what I'm going to use for demon eyes in this case. Um, and uh, we'll cover that shortly. So now I have the back of the light here and I did already drill holes for the breather bench. Uh, I am doing three and three. Um, once again, we do sell them. Uh, I believe it's 32 breather patches, it's just $10. And so in the end, really just adding a bunch to these lights helps to reduce the chances of condensation and properly placing them around the light helps even more. So, you know, in the case of this light, there's not really a good way to just put two and two. Uh, three and three just makes it easier. So uh, I just have one, two, kind of the both corners, and then another one here, and then equal sizing, uh, spacing at least uh, on the bottom side as well. So uh, that's kind of the thought behind that. Now, you do need to remove this section. I already did it because it's a little bit of a challenge with this, but you basically have these tabs at, uh, you can just kind of like pinch and uh, get them to pop out. Now, I just say just, just kind of, 
it is a little bit of a challenge, so just keep that in mind. And you don't want to mangle these up too much um, because if you do, it will be difficult to put them back on. But if you can just kind of like pinch that down a little bit, it'll pop out and you just kind of work on all three, well, the two up top. And then on the bottom is just a screw on the back side here. And if you just back that out, the bottom part will just come right out. So then you have uh, what's left here is the little jewel eye piece here. And for that, you're just gonna have these two plugs and then these four plugs here that you can just disconnect. And just like that, the projector is ready to come out and the backside is good to put away. Um, now, do keep in mind, we will have to add a cable gland to route our wires out. Um, there's really no easy way to put it out uh, other than adding a cable gland. So you're gonna keep that in mind and move on to this one. Now, you're gonna wanna remove this top bezel and there are two screws on the top and there's one here and another one right there. We're gonna pull those screws out. That top part will pop right off and then it'll just pop right off like that. Uh, keep in mind with the chrome and everything like that, you don't ideally really want to touch it because you get fingerprints on it and stuff. And uh, for chrome, getting the fingerprints off sometimes can be a little bit of a challenge. So uh, ideally try not to touch that anymore than you have to. Uh, as far as the lenses go, now the Alpha Rex lenses are a very unique design. Uh, they are almost more like a cup. And the lens itself is the bottom of the cup. And then there is a uh, plastic part of the lens that comes back. So you see in the case of this here, the lens is kind of down in here. And then all of this is hollow up into the back here where it bolts on. And this is uh, pretty typical of uh, any of the Alpha Rex uh, Novas for sure. Um, I believe even most of the pros are kind of the same. It depends on which set you get. Uh, but the problem with these is that etching is next to impossible. Um, I'm sure somebody somewhere will work through it and make it happen, but it is not simple. Uh, reason being is that the surface that you would have to etch is tucked in there about two inches deep, uh, which would make it very difficult to get any kind of vinyl pattern on there to etch. Uh, and it would also make it very difficult, nearly impossible for a laser to shoot in there and actually mark uh, that because lasers generally have to be uh, within a certain proximity of the surface that they're cutting or etching to work properly. So uh, in general, I would not recommend trying to etch these. Uh, I am not sure if anyone has successfully done that. Maybe there's someone that has. If you have, let me know. I'd love to see how you did it. Uh, but I have not been able to find a set that I could do this to. I have a set of Alpha Rex on my, uh, my truck and uh, I could never figure out a way to etch them. So uh, not gonna bother on this set, but we are gonna add Demon Eyes. Now adding Demon Eyes is also a little bit of a challenge on the way these projectors are laid out because there is no real hole on the top to point an LED in. Uh, you can't easily put an LED inside because they are quite small projectors. Um, now you can use our traditional demon eyes if you choose, uh, but in the case of these, uh, for one, it would get pretty expensive because you would have to have actually four sets of demon eyes. And for two, uh, I don't know that it necessarily is gonna bring you a whole lot of extra output to go with our five volt demon eyes versus going with uh, another option. And the option I'm gonna go with is our 12 mil wide UCS strips. So we did use eight mil on the front bezel because that just fit better to run two rows. But the 12 mil, it's a little bit more dense. So we're gonna be able to get two sections at six LEDs in each demon eye. And because of the sizing of this and the way that it's laid out, it'll actually be pretty bright at that point. Uh, I would say from at least my eyes, on the same level as what the single demon eye will do. A demon eye in most applications is just easier to install and that's the reason why most of the time that's what I go with but you'll see that on occasion I do go with the UCS route instead. There is more work involved to do that but it's cheaper and 
if you can get enough LEDs in there, the output is just as good. If you had one single LED for a UCS, it wouldn't be great, but they come in groups of three generally. Uh, and in the case of these, I can get six, um, but like a pod. I wouldn't recommend using our pods for demon eyes. The output's just not gonna be enough, but this will effectively be six of our uh, UCS pods on each. So six, 12, 18, and 24 LEDs for our demon eyes. The output is gonna be excellent. It will be able to stick with 12 volts, so I will not actually have to use any inverters in these lights, which is gonna make life even easier. Um, and the process of putting them on is not actually that hard. Uh, if you wanted to remove these lenses, you do have to break it down further than what we have. Now, most of the time, these are actually balanced from or aimed from the factory. So many times there will be washers on some and not others, and that's because they do actually aim them to have a uniform pattern on the output and so if you mess with that then you have to make sure that you keep track of what washer was where and you put it all back and you make sure the output is even as it is right now i haven't done anything to affect the output from alpharex so uh, there's not really a huge benefit to do that but if you were to remove the lenses you would have to because the screws are actually on the back side of each of these projectors so you would have to remove the screws that are on the bottom here and once again, you have four screws for each projector, some with washers between the plastic bracket and the projector and some not. And you have to keep in mind which ones do, which ones don't, and make sure that you put them all back in the same way to make sure it all levels out. So as well as the fact that you also have to make sure you get the right pro projectors in the right place. So like in the case of these two, these are both high and low. That is what these little uh, solenoids here are for. Those are for flappers. And these would be a dedicated high beam from what it looks like. Um, I don't see any kind of a cutoff shield or anything in there. So dedicated high beams and these would be the high and low uh, projector outputs. So um, just something to keep in mind if you are quoting this for somebody or if you're building it yourself, uh, the feasibility of etching lenses with Alpharex in general, I wouldn't even try it because if you mess one of these lenses up, I don't even know the process to get a replacement. It may be as bad as having to buy an entire light. So um, very high risk to even try to etch these. And if you do mess them up and have to replace it, it's going to be very high cost. So I definitely would not try etching the lenses. Um, but once again, if you have done it and you had success, I'd love to hear how you did it. Uh, but Demon eyes. Demon eyes definitely doable. And I'll kind of show you the process here. So for me, the easiest process is using an ultrasonic cutter and just cutting out a slot here right along the base of the projector so that we can put our strips in there. These are the 12 mil UCS strips that I'll be using. So it gives you kind of an idea. You can put it there, just get a rough idea of how much you actually have to cut out. So as you can see, I did cut out uh, just a little slot in there. It's just actually right by the base of the little screw holes here and just cut across and back. And ideally you wanna get as many of those six LEDs. We're gonna cut, uh, cut this down just a little bit. And as many of those six LEDs as you can that you wanna try to get in there. And you wanna have enough of a lip left over that you can glue this in place. Uh, and it's not just kind of like dangling in there. So um, that's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, you could probably cut just a little bit more so it drops down in just a little bit further. The idea would be that LEDs are very directional. So if you can get these LEDs to sort of aim forward a little bit, uh, you're going to have a better output on the actual projector itself. So, um, you know, this is kind of where customization comes in a little bit. Uh, much of retrofitting, at least on the higher level, is very much customization. So as much as we try to make these things somewhat easy to install and things like that, um, you got to kind of remember that a lot of the times you're going to get a better result if you can sort of customize the things yourself to fit better, to work better, or to take things that are not traditionally made for a certain application and make them work. Um, you know, a lot of times I get asked about uh, custom kits and things for certain cars. And there are companies that do that and have done it for years and do really well with it. The problem is 
A lot of times if you have certain kits for certain cars, it limits you greatly because you, you have to have so many kits for each car and that means you have more SKUs, you have more products, you have more inventory, you have more invested and it makes it harder to develop new things, uh, which is something I, I try to kind of steer away from. I've done some um, and the little bit that I've done, I quite honestly, the, the money coming in from that isn't quite enough to fuel the innovation that I'm trying to do. Whereas if I go with more universal things like these strips, uh, they can be made to work in the application and it enables me to be able to improve on the products because I can have a faster turnaround on the products. So things like these strips sell pretty well because they're a universal product and can be used on many different applications. Whereas if I use this exact same LED and I made custom boards for a bunch of different lights, the turnaround on those parts would be much longer and that unfortunately would mean a much larger initial investment as well as much less money that I can pump into new development and new products. Um, so just keep that in mind. A lot of the companies that have these drop-in boards, they're very far behind the times. And one of the main reasons being, if they were to develop, uh, start using UCS on all their boards, they would instantly make all their old inventory obsolete. And that would not be a very good business decision to make. So um, that's kind of the reason why I myself don't push in that direction to do a whole bunch of custom boards. I have some and I've done a few and it's mostly on cars that you really can't make boards out of them. So things like the K5s and the Chargers are two cars that it would not be easy to take these and make the shapes that you need for those cars. So I did make them for that. Uh, and to be honest with you, the K5s haven't sold a ton. Uh, the Chargers do really well, but um, that just kind of goes into it there. You know, it's a big initial investment and it takes a while to get that back. And then unfortunately that kind of stifles innovation and in moving forward. So a uh, little spiel on that as to why I don't go that direction. Uh, but in the case of this, it's not hard to generally take something that's more of a universal product and make it into something that's cheap and effective. We do have Demon Eyes that would totally work in this application. You would just have to cut a little bit differently and aim that Demon Eye down in there and it will work fine. But this is cheaper. It's gonna have just as good of output because of the density of the number of LEDs that we're putting in there. And it's 12 volt. So I won't have to worry about adding an additional inverter in each light to run my demon eyes. So just something to think about. So I'm gonna go in and I am going to get these to fit as good as I can with a little bit of a forward angle to them so they light up the whole projector. I'm gonna secure them in place with glue and I'm gonna cut them down to size. Uh, once again, we're gonna use six LEDs total, so two sections for each, and I am going to link them so that way it does flow in a direction. Now keep in mind, uh, you can run, when you're running the Ghost, you can run in either direction and you can adjust in the app. But in general, when wiring things up, if you can, it's a good idea to have things flow uniformly. So in the case of this light, the projector closest to the grill and so in general flow motion, uh, sequential turns or things like that, it's gonna flow from here outward. So I'm probably gonna wanna put my data in here, data out to the data in here, data out to the data in here, data out to the data in there. And I am gonna use wiring to connect all that together. Now, I usually am very big on using 18 gauge wiring in general within the lights, but uh, I, for, Things like this and smaller PCBs, I do find that a 20 gauge wire is much easier to work with and much easier to solder. And as long as you still have 18 gauge wiring and you're power injecting at different points, it doesn't seem to have any issues. In the case of this, I'm only gonna have 24 LEDs, so the power draw is actually not gonna be too bad. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna power eject at the front, power eject at the end, and then I'll have my data out from here that will go to the front bezel where I will have that power injected going to the front bezel. So that way I don't have all the power for the front bezel coming through this strip, through that strip, through that strip, through that strip, and then to the front bezel where I have a ton of LEDs. 
Instead, it's gonna be power injected here, power injected here, and power injected going to that front bezel. So the load is going to be much lighter on these first LEDs here. But that will be the plan directly from the ghost controller. This will be the first LED from the controller into the light. So um, hopefully that makes sense. But the, the idea of power injection is, is pretty important. You got to keep in mind with these things, it's not quite like RGB, like the traditional stuff. Um, this stuff just gets a constant signal from the battery or from an inverter, depending on what voltage you need. And then the color changing and all of that is done by the data line, which is uh, why these are called smart LEDs versus dumb LEDs. So uh, the traditional uh, RGB halos and LEDs and things like that, they're really more of a dumb LED where they have a wire for each color and you alternate the power going to each of those wires to amplify or reduce the light output of each LED. And that means that every LED does the same thing, whereas with addressable, you can control each LED individually via that little smart chip. And in the case of the UCS, the smart chip is actually on the back of the uh, PCB. And one of the reasons we use rigid PCBs for our thinner stuff. Uh, and then when it comes to things that need to be more flexible, we do have the wider strips for things like the infinity mirrors. Uh, where that PCB is still on there, or the chip is still on the PCB, but it's just moved to the face of the PCB for that purpose. So uh, once again, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just uh, cut the rest of these with the ultrasonic cutter, secure those strips in place, cut them in size, and I'll come back and I'll show you the next part. So as you can see, I do have them secured now, glued in place. I'll let the glue dry a little bit there, and they are good to go now. The wiring is ran through here. Uh, so this is going to be my input wire. I ran it a little bit long because I'm going to run this out the back of the light and that will be what connects to the controller. Uh, then it comes in here, it goes up and just steps back and I just kind of like tucked it back out of the way. That way the little bezel can go right on top and not have any issues. And each board feeds into the next board uh, with them with a slight angle so it's aimed forward a little better output that way. At the end, it comes out here, both power and data and it joins back up here where I have the powers joining together. So the power coming into the light will feed both the front and end of the Demon Eye run, as well as it will split off and feed the power that will go to the front bezel. Uh, so once again, that will take the load off of the Demon Eyes themselves to feed the power to the bezel. Um, so this is kind of an example of power injection done in a fairly simple method. The wiring's just going down underneath here uh, and that will feed it for both sides and reduce the amount of load that your LEDs themselves have, uh, as well as just creating a little bit of a redundancy in the event that a power line or some other connection were to break at some point. Let's say one of the power lines at the top here were to break uh, a connection somehow, uh, you would actually still be feeding power through the backside and if any one of the power or grounds were to break, once again, not sure how, but somehow uh, between the demon eyes, they would still actually fully work because all they need is data and then power injection from rear or front to keep them going. So just kind of think of it like that. So the output will be here and that will be on the same side as the input on the bezel. Uh, so that'll work well. Uh, and then we have this bezel, uh, which will just slide right on top like that and I will bolt it into place and we'll go ahead and set this to the side and do our last bit of work on the back of the housing. Now we are going to install our cable gland where we're going to run our wires out to actually connect to the controller itself. Um, for that, the location that I have chosen is right here. So we're going to drill in and then this will just tuck away right in there. That way it's out of the way. One thing you do want to keep in mind with lights when you are installing cable glands is to put it in a place where it is not going to come into contact with anything on the frame. Uh, and lights will vary a little bit as to what parts of the frame might sit closer to a light and not. So. Uh, you do have to be a little bit careful and try to be conscious of that when you're putting everything together. Uh, places around the top on a lot of cars are actually going to be really close and other 
times places around the back can be close as well. Uh, you can also pay attention to uh, locations that the manufacturer puts uh, cable glands or things like that. Uh, sometimes those are a little bit of a safer spot, possibly somewhere around here like that would be okay. Uh, but in the case of this one here, this will keep it right out of the way. It'll work well and it'll actually aim it down. So um, pretty much no chance of any water getting in there once we seal it shut. Um, and any water that did would just leak right out. So uh, that is where I will go ahead and drill a hole. Uh, also keeping in mind that when you do choose a location, it's very important to look behind and see where anything or components might be inside of the light. Something like this, if you were to drill a hole behind here, you would go right into this little controller here and that would cause you some issues with your projectors. So you don't wanna do that. Another idea would be this little dry pack here. Uh, if you were to puncture that, uh, it is a fine white powder that is very difficult to clean up. So not ideal to put it there. So once again, just check inside, make sure you're not putting it anywhere that's gonna cause damage to the light or damage to a component inside of the light. Uh, drill your hole, put your cable gland in, run your wire out the back. see our cable band is now installed and secured in place with the back nut and now we can go ahead and put our projectors back in and we're going to be careful to make sure that we plug everything back in the way that it was plugged originally um, as far as these connectors go and we will run this wire out the cable gland as well uh, and then we should pretty much be ready for uh, putting everything back together Now we got the projectors back in, screwed in place. You're gonna to wanna to keep in mind the level uh, of where they need to be to be level. Uh, and it is very likely that these will have to be adjusted slightly when they're on the car, but usually you can get a pretty good idea, ballpark, as to where they are, just kind of comparing the top of the light, the bottom of the light, and the angle of the projectors, and that will get you really close. Uh, and then as with just about any kind of set that you buy online or you install on a car, they do generally need to be adjusted slightly uh, on the bottom adjustment uh, screw here in order to get the proper alignment. That is pretty normal if you buy a light from anywhere. Uh, they will usually be close, but almost never are gonna be perfect. So um, definitely make sure anybody that's buying these from you knows, or uh, in the case that you're doing it yourself, you are prepared for that. Now another wire that you are going to want to run will be your DRL and your turn signal wires and it's just going to make install a lot easier. You can tap that externally using the main plug on the light itself, uh, but especially in the case if you're going to have the customer install things, sometimes it's a lot easier to just tap inside of the light and then run the wire out along with your plug. Uh, so in the case of this light here, uh, I have already tested being that it was an LED light. I was able to just uh, pin uh, probe several pins on the back of this plug here just to verify and make sure that I had the right connection and it does appear that the yellow wire on this connection is your turn signal and the red wire is your DRL connection. Uh, the white wire goes to uh, these plugs up here so uh, I'm not actually going to use that but in the case of this one here we are going to use the red and we are going to use the yellow. Uh, so uh, for this light, this is the driver's side light for the charger, so all I will be doing is tapping the yellow wire and running that out the cable gland as well so that we can get that connection. Uh, and on the other light, I already tapped the DRL and the turn signal and ran them out as well. Uh, and for that one, once again, I did use an 8-pin connector. For this one, I'm going to use a 6-pin. Now for the uh, next part here, um, you know, you can always run it just like that if you want to, but I usually like to try to clean it up a little bit. So I'll use a little bit of this uh, braided sleeving here and I will just run that over top of both of these wires. Once get the braided sleeving over top, uh, just cut it back so that you have a little bit of that extra sleeving hanging over the side. And we're gonna put a piece of uh, 
3-1 shrink tubing with the adhesive line. Uh, the adhesive line is really nice to use on this stuff because it usually will grip a little bit better. Whereas if you use a non-adhesive line, which is a lot cheaper, um, usually it'll slide back and forth on the wiring. Uh, so it's just a little bit less professional to use that stuff. So I, I kind of like the, the uh, adhesive lined uh, three to one shrink tubing. Uh, and then as far as this goes, I will just pull that braided sleeving over exposing the wires to try to get that turn signal wire out of there as well and I'm just gonna pull that down and I'd like to use a clamp like this uh, and that just holds the braided sleeving out of the way that way I have access to the wires themselves I use my wire strippers here just go ahead and take back a little bit of that and then I will use one of those plugs that I was talking about one of the uh, waterproof barrel connectors now these uh, in general for me have proven to be a lot more sturdy uh, being that they are factory molded so um, you know yanking on the wires uh, to connect and disconnect it's a lot less likely that wires are able to pull out uh, historically in the past I used um, pin style where you push it into the back of the connector and then it snaps in place and those do generally work well the problem comes with uh, a little bit of manhandling by customers so sometimes if they're plugging in a light or unplugging a light um, you know there's only so many things they can grab a hold of so most of the time when they're pulling them apart they're attempting to push the pin in to release the plug and then yanking on the wiring and sometimes what that does is it actually creates a weak connection at the back of that plug and will actually break the connection so after having a few people have that issue i decided to upgrade to this style and once again the main reason being these are molded uh, it is very difficult to pull the wires out of these i've never seen it done um, i'm sure if you really wanted to you could but uh, main point in this being they still are waterproof, they screw in. They're very small profile uh, compared to the pin style plugs. Um, and then on the back side, the wires are just sticking out like a pigtail, so it's really easy to use. And as far as wiring goes, one downside to this style plug, they're generally a little bit lower gauge wiring. So it is like a 22 gauge versus the 18 gauge that I generally like to use. But it's pretty simple to actually just take two wires and double them up and get that same amount of wiring that you need for like an 18 gauge wire uh, so in the case of this i have done lights that are uh, pushing almost 10 amps in one light before and it was able to run over this without any issues so um, for the most part it works pretty well now this is the six pin wire so there are six wires to it uh, to this plug and the wire colors are green, white, blue, black, yellow, and red. And in the case of this one here, what I generally do is white and black, I will make a ground. So I will join those two together. And red and yellow, I will actually make a power. I will use blue as my turn signal and green will be my data. Um, and you know, I know, logically speaking, you would think yellow would be the turn, uh, but I think originally the reason being is that the five pin plugs do not have a yellow uh, wire in them. They just have a blue. Um, so I just kind of chose the blue because it's in all uh, three sizes, the five pin, six pin, and eight pin. And I just kind of stuck with it just to keep it safe. Uh, I actually have a little cheat sheet here that I took a picture and I kind of labeled it out. Uh, I don't unfortunately have that on the website. Uh, actually, I don't even know if I have a digital form of that anymore. So, um, But that, that's the way I do it. There's nothing to say that you can't change the wire order in the way that you want to do it. Just keep in mind, uh, you do need ideally to be consistent in whatever method you use so in the event that your customer is having an issue many times my customers won't send the harness back in because the harness is installed on the car and everything's ran and that way they just pull the lights send me the lights and i can use a harness that i have here so uh, consistency is the most important thing uh, this is the way that i do it this is the way the pro controllers are done on the website so uh, if you want to stay consistent with what i'm doing that's how i do it if you want to do it your own method by all means go for it uh, but in the case of these, 
like I said, I would just strip back the little sheathing there on all of them and twist together the two that I have dedicated to power, the two that I have dedicated to ground, and then I have my low power data and my low power turn signal. So those don't really need to be 18 gauge. Uh, I have actually reached out uh, several times to try and get some custom made 18 gauge wires done with this many pins uh, in the barrel connector styles. Uh, and unfortunately at this point, it seems to be rather difficult to get a manufacturer to do it, but hopefully one day I can afford to pay them for the molds and everything they're gonna have to do to make it. But until then, I do have these, I have been using these and I'm really happy with them. So uh, if you are looking for a solid option, uh, something that I trust and use on my own builds, these are available on the website. So just like that, I have uh, finished soldering the wires together, put the shrink tubing over top, shrunk that down, moved the braided sleeving over top again, and uh, slid down our three to one adhesive line shrink tubing just to keep everything in place. And once again, once it does cool down, it holds really well, it won't move on you. So uh, I do prefer the three to one adhesive line here, uh, and then just two to one is perfectly fine on the wiring underneath of the braided sleeving. So now we are ready to take this over and get ready to seal it up in the oven. So we're gonna move over that. So now I went ahead and put the lights uh, back together just loosely. I don't have any butyl in the channels yet just to make sure that everything's working right. I went ahead and connected up signals and things like that. So we'll go ahead and see uh, how they work. And I did already program the lights as well off camera. Um, that process is relatively easy, and I do have a video on the channel going into more detail on that. Uh, but in the case of these lights, I literally only have two sections. I have one section for all eight uh, addresses for the LEDs on the Demon Eyes. And then I, the other uh, section is for the C-Light itself, which I have arranged as a halo. So I just added in all the LEDs that are on it, arrange it as a halo, and clock it so that it flows evenly. But as you can see, I have the startup animation there and it flows. And then I have currently just one of the turn signals hooked up. Uh, obviously both of them have been tested, they do work, uh, but to kind of show you the differentiation between there uh, and the event that the turn signal on this side is going, that's what this side of the car will do and then vice versa. So you get an idea uh, as to what to expect for that. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind when testing on a bench for lights like this, a lot of times if there's circuitry inside, which we're still keeping the Alpharex circuitry to try to avoid any dash lights, um, you will have to uh, run a ground as well to get the signals to work right. So if you just put power to the turn signal pin or power to the DRL pin, you may have some issues. Uh, I believe the DRL pin was working okay, but the turn signal would not work properly. Um, and if you had both connected, uh, then it would, the turn signal basically makes the DRL, it does something weird. So if it does something weird for you when you try to do that, it's because you do not have a ground connected. So go ahead and connect the ground as well. And everything should work as it will on the car. Now, once again, if you're uh, buying a set of lights like this already built, once you plug it into the car, that won't be an issue because all those pins will make contact with the car. So the ground will be connected on the car. But this is just for bench testing. Uh, if you do that, and this goes for a lot of lights with uh, circuitry and modules inside, uh, even if you put like hyper flash resistors inside, uh, you will have to factor that in uh, for the way that the lights work. So as you can see, that is working well. As well as I did go ahead and queue up a couple show modes and let them run for a few hours. And I've got them currently connected to the A button on the remote here. Now, in the case of these lights, I am using a Ghost Plus. And the benefit of the Plus being that I do not have to worry about the, uh, the B button on this remote. I actually deactivated the B button uh, on this power saver. And that way, it is much more automated. The lights will turn on and off on their own. So if you go in the app, you tell it to do a show mode, the lights will turn on, the power will connect. If you go in the app, you tell it to turn off, the lights will turn off and the power will disconnect. Uh, if you go for a drive, they will automatically turn on. 
and they will automatically disconnect. So everything is uh, a little bit more automated that way. And that's by using the plus and the switches and just wiring in that switch into uh, well, any one of the four switches on the plus uh, for power, wiring that into any one of the three inputs on the power saver, uh, battery savers, and that will become your automated trigger. And then you just go into the, um, the voltage tab in the Ghost app and set whichever one of those four switches you wired into the power saver as triggered. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Uh, if you need to rewind, watch it a couple times, it should make sense. Um, but it's not very difficult once you understand what it is. It's a pretty simple process. In the case of my builds, I think I'm going to start doing the plus more just because of the number of customers that get really confused as to whether or not they turn their lights on with the remote. Um, unfortunately, it, it can be a little bit tricky. And, you know, I understand that. And if another 30 bucks can avoid that problem, I'm going to implement that in my pricing to reflect that upgrade. Uh, as you can see, I've got a couple show modes running here, and I can just push the A button and turn them right off just like that. And start up and shut down animations. Uh, right now it is doing a rainbow road, but obviously that is changeable within the app as well as the turn signals, which right now is doing waves, where it just starts at this side, flows to the outside, and just moves kind of like a pattern. So um, it's a little bit of a you know, preference thing as to what you prefer for your turn signals and your DRL startups, and you can change it on the fly. So now uh, we are gonna go ahead and seal these lights up. So as I said, I've already tested everything. Everything is working as it should. Uh, so now it's a good time to go ahead and get these sealed up. For sealing them up, we are gonna be using butyl. Now on the website, we do sell uh, the Next Level Neo rubber butyl. Uh, it is available in a roll form. And this is usually enough to do at least a full set of lights if you had Permaseal originally. Uh, and if your lights had Butyl originally and you just want to top it off a little bit to prevent leaks, it won't take a whole lot of this to do that. So uh, one roll will go pretty far. I would say in most cases you can do almost two sets of lights with Permaseal. Um, but we'll go ahead and get that uh, put inside the channels. The oven's already preheating. Um, I'll go ahead and disconnect some of this electrical and we'll get these things sealed up. 